Tina Arndt is a writer and commentator. She's known for being one of Australia's first sex therapists and a former feminist before becoming one of the leading men's rights advocates. She's also worked in government on committees for the reformation of family law and dedicates her time to dispelling the myths that men are monsters. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Bettina. Yes, that's fine. I, I don't regard myself as advocating for men's rights because it's not about rights. It's about fair treatment for both genders. And that means I talk about men's issues that often get silenced. <laughs> but I see, I mean, I'm not demanding men's rights. I'm saying, why aren't we treating men and women fairly? Okay, very good. Um, so, first, congratulations on your recent Order of Australia Award. Uh, this is a, a good point to sort of clarify the work that you do. Uh, can you tell people what the Order of Australia Award is and what you've won yours for? Well, this is part of our honour system where people have their work recognised. They have, uh, you know, it's a statement, I suppose, of the fact that people value their achievements. And I was delighted. Someone, I don't know who, nominated me. It goes before an awards committee, um, an honours committee, which actually includes 11 women from on the 16 people who make the decision. Um, and they get presented with all the evidence regarding people's achievements and in my case, I was very thrilled that they decided to order, offer me uh, an award, which is as a member of the Order of Australia, um, for my, my, I come in with exact wording, services as a, you know, a social commentator through gender, you know, for gender equity through advocacy for men. And that's what's really significant to me because I think I am working and have been all my life working for genuine gender equity. But I see myself as now addressing the real problem that it's men in many areas who aren't getting fair treatment. Mm. So why, why are people so angry that someone is sticking up for men these days? Yeah, that is the big question, Jesse. I mean, the, the outrage that has greeted my award says an awful lot, sadly, about our anti-male culture and about the fact that anyone who challenges the anti-male neg narrative is seen as really dangerous. Um, I mean, the effort people have put into digging up dirt about me in the next week has been quite extraordinary. And the pile on, including, you know, the Victorian Attorney General writing to the Governor General asking for my award to be rescinded is I absolutely unheard of um you know all sorts of people out there attacking me and basing it on total misinformation on an absolute dirt campaign which is misrepresenting my life's work and particularly misrepresenting some of the things i've done in recent years um yeah it's been quite extraordinary and it says a great deal well i, I take it as a huge compliment jesse because it says that people see me as really dangerous they say it's, it's an indication that I'm getting somewhere. I'm achieving something in advocating for men and they want to take me down. And what does that say? Mm. This, um, the attacks on you seem to be lodged by, uh, by a lot of people who would consider themselves, um, feminists. So doing a bit of reading on you, my understanding is that you, you're a former feminist up until, the, the mid to late 80s, at which point you gave that up. Can you, to set a context, can you tell me about feminism and sort of where feminism is now compared to where it would have been in 30 years ago? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I was, I, I got involved in my whole career in a way because of feminism. I, mean, I was trained to be a clinical psychologist, but um, I started reading The Female Unit, you know, Jermaine Greer's famous book. I started reading all the feminist books that were being released at that time, got terribly excited by the women's movement, wanted to do something for women. And that's why I got involved in sex therapy, because uh, it seemed to me that women weren't having nearly as good a time in bed as they should. I mean, they were having a lot of trouble with sexual satisfaction. I did my research, my th master's thesis on that. Um, and that's what inspired me to get involved. And, to, and then I went out in the community doing adult sex education, mainly addressing women. But what happened to me is inevitably because I was the person out there talking about sex, men started to talk to me and I started to listen to what it's like being on the other side of the fence. 
And I gradually started writing about issues like, for instance, family law. Um, at that time, I mean, it was even worse than now in some ways in that there was just an assumption that mothers would get custody, uh, that women had a right, mothers had a right to move anywhere they liked. To, you know, they had total control over decisions regarding their children after divorce. And men were being, lots of men were being totally excluded. And I started to write about that. And I just, I mean, I remember sitting there once and I got a, a I received a, a, a letter, a stale mail letter yes. <laughs> from, a, from a judge out of the blue, writing to me saying, you're totally right. He was retiring from the family court after a long career in the family court. He said, we've made an enormous mistake. We've given too much power to the custodial parent, and that power is often being abused. And he taught, and he gave me long interviews then talking about what how um, fathers were really being done over in the family court system, dealing with issues like false accusations, having no ability to disprove those accusations which were being used against them to deny them contact with their children, um, all the issues that have, in fact, some of them have got much worse since then. I got then got involved in, I was on government committees, funnily enough, advocating for men in, in regard to family law issues. Um, so I, that's what started to talk me. That issue, I suppose, in particular, started to make, to make me think, what is going on here? I mean, I was, we were, that was a time we were absolutely celebrating women's achievements because women were starting to do so well. Girls were just acing it in schools. Um, there were all sorts of areas where women were taking their rightful place in the world, having choices they never had before. But, and that's what I wanted. But what I didn't want was women's achievements to be at the expense of men and for all our laws, rules and regulations to be tilted to favour women at the expense of men. And that's not what I was interested in feminism. That's not what attracted me to feminism. And I, I know the majority of people are really unhappy at the fact that feminism had gone on from, you know, working for a level playing, playing field to containing a lot of narrative that is very anti-male. And luckily, there are lots and lots of women like me, mothers of sons, women who have men they love in their lives, who don't want to see males constantly denigrated. When did, uh, I mean, you explained a little bit of this process, but when you began to look or after the book came out and speaking more with men and writing about this, the... Bettina Arn is a controversial figure, is relatively new, at least to me. Probably only the last couple of years have I really seen the media storm around it. When did it be begin to become a, a problem for you of talking about the wrongdoings uh, that have been happening to men? Oh, there's always been a certain amount of conflict, but it, the, the the dirt campaign, this absolute pile on, is being driven by particular activists. And it's because I'm having enormous success in one in one of my activities. One of my major passions is to expose what's happening on our campuses. Uh, we've had years now of university after, campuses. University campuses. Okay. Um, we've had years now of um, feminist activists claiming there's a rape crisis on our campuses, and that's a manufactured campaign. They they in fact enlisted the Human Rights Commission to spend a million dollars of taxpayer money that they hoped would prove there was a rape crisis on our campuses. And that that survey proved a total fizzer for the feminists because it, it emphatically showed we don't have a rape crisis on our campus. 0.8% of students on, a, on all our, you know, in that survey had experienced any sort of sexual assault using the broadest possible definition, including tricked into sex against your will or being touched by a stranger on the change of uni. Um, so that's 99.2% have had nothing like that ever happen to them, of the students surveyed, which is, of course, for celebration. We don't have a rape crisis, but the activists still managed to persuade our universities to pretend there was a real issue here. And they beat up all the statistics on sexual harassment, which was mainly unwanted staring. What the survey found was 
you know, significant percentage is said that a man had, ever, had looked at them in the way they didn't like or they, someone had made a joke or a comment they didn't like. Mm. This was presented as sexual violence. This was used as an excuse for the universities to get involved in investigating and adjudicating rape. And I spent last year on university campuses confronting students, I mean, g- giving talks, but confronting enormous violent demonstrations from students who didn't want me talking about that, who didn't want me telling the truth about the fact there's no rape crisis, um, and particularly didn't want me talking about the fact that What the feminists are doing on our university campuses is setting up kangaroo courts, is setting up, they're usurping criminal law to set up regulations to investigate, adjudicate rape using a totally unfair system where the accused don't get their legal rights in any way protected. And I've been out there fighting this for over a year and I'm winning. We've just had a big... uh, Supreme Court case in Queensland, which ruled it's illegal for universities to do this. So the point about this, Jesse, is I'm getting runs on the board. I am managing to expose what's going on on our campuses. And the activists who are really unhappy about what I'm doing are the ones who, for the last week particularly, and for the last two years, have been out there spreading dirt about me cherry-picking bits and pieces from my work, misrepresenting what my work actually does and says to try to present me in the worst possible light. And if people will please go to my website, I have give you chapter and verse of all the allegations that are being made about me and showing people what is wrong about the way I'm being misrepresented. We we've agreed not to talk about that until the end because we, we want to hear about the work oh, that mind. you're doing. You can do but, it now. Oh, no, you can do like, that. I can talk about that now. Okay. If but, you like, that's fine. But what I'd like you to... You can ask me. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, have you... I think we, we both knew the vitriol that would come out of this when you won the Order of a, a Australia Award. Has it surprised you just how big it's become? I suppose what surprises me is the fact that our media can be so easily manipulated by misinformation and by a deliberate dirt campaign and that they all buy into this without acknowledging where it's all coming from. I mean, that's what I find really depressing. That I mean, for, I'll give you an example. There's an interview I did, uh, I think it was last year now, uh, with a, a man who was convicted of having a teacher who was convicted of having sex with his pupil, and he went to jail. Mm -hmm. And I made a video with him, decided to do an interview with him, because a judge had spoken out uh, about the fact that this man who'd served his time in prison was back in the community, was being targeted by vigilante groups in Tasmania. He was trying to do study at the University of Tasmania. Um, The... Activists weren't letting him leave the house. They were screaming abuse, calling him a pedo. Um, The university had allowed him to study there. They systematically made it impossible for him to study there. And this judge said, this is not how we run our legal system. We can't have people deciding that they're going to determine what justice people receive once they've served their sentence. And I decided to do an interview with him. If I went back and looked at that interview again, I'd probably do something slightly differently. But the whole interview actually started with me saying, you've done something terribly wrong. Do you admit that? Do you, do you acknowledge you should have gone to prison? So I set out the whole thing very carefully. Selected bits of that video are being played to damage me. And the, the one mistake I really made in that interview was, I talked about a very a broader issue in that context, which is the, the question of the vulnerability of teachers to false accusations. I'm not saying there was – this is a, a clear-cut case. This is a proven case where the girl concerned uh, was a victim of a man misusing his power. There was no question about that. 
But I, in that interview, went into the broader question of what, what, what are we doing? We're not allowed, we're going to have a real problem in men not daring to ever work in a school system because they're really vulnerable to false accusations by students and that girls can sometimes be very seductive in a school environment. And one of the interesting things for me in the last week is a number of teachers have written to me from across Australia saying that is exactly what they're afraid of. That is what's happening, that it's very easy for a girl who doesn't like a, a teacher um, to make that sort of accusation against him. Um, anyway, that I probably shouldn't have included that particular comment in this interview, but it's being shown out of context in a deliberate attempt to denigrate me and misrepresent my work. Okay. Um Moving back to about the work that you do, again, I'd, I'd like can to cover I that. one more thing? Of course I just can. want to give, Jesse, I wanted to give one more example. So this is an orchestrated campaign to dig up misinformation, cherry-pick quotes from particular articles I've written and present them in a way that suggests I'm, a lot, you know, I'm not doing the right thing and acknowledge the importance of protecting children from sexual abuse, that I'm denigrating victims of sexual abuse and so on. Very funny thing. One of the quotes that's being sent out and, and, and um, circulated in the media this week involves a case of a Canberra doctor who was, it's alleged that I say that that doctor, he, he was involved in, in with 13 women, um, a sexual abuse claim that was made against him for abusing, you know, for getting involved in sexual activity as a doctor with his patients. And I, in fact, was a victim of that doctor. And the article that's being misused against me was an article I wrote talking about the fact that I was a 19-year-old student in Canberra, went along to that doctor who, in his surgery, manipulated me. He, I, I thought I was pregnant. He said, oh, well, if you have an orgasm, it might help bring on the period. And he started stimulating me. And I thought that was very weird. You know, I, I was pretty naive, but I thought that was a bit of a weird thing to have happened to me. Yes. But it never, I never, never worried me. It wasn't a big deal. Twenty-five years later, all these accusations started coming out about him, and ultimately, he was retired by then as a doctor. Uh, it was a complicated story. The judge ruled that, that no action should be taken against him because it was too long after the incidents occurred. There wasn't any medical records and so on. I wrote a long piece, a 4,000-word article, three or 4,000-word article about this, what happened to me as a victim of this man. And the hilarious thing is this article has been spread around this week saying I, you know, denigrated <laughs> uh, victims of sexual abuse by alleging that it wasn't re reasonable that this man was charged for his crimes by talking about other aspects of that case. And, of course, they never mentioned the fact that I was one of his victims. And I had every right to write about that. I'm putting that article up on my website this week. I'd really love people to read about them, this and to read what I had to say so they know how my words are being misrepresented. You've and, you know, been... the funny thing, Jesse, the, the Attorney General this week, the Victorian Attorney General, accused me. One of the she wrote to the Governor General, alleging I was not doing the right thing by victims of sexual abuse. Well, lady, I know I can speak as a victim of sexual abuse. I can define my own experiences. I have every right to speak out about that, and she has no right to tell sex, victims of abuse how their experiences are to be defined. You've been in media for a few decades now. Have you always has the well, media? Yeah, five decades I've been working in the media. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Long history. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Have you? Do you feel that it's moved more to the left? Do you feel that it was a little bit more centrist? Because uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised. And again, we will have listeners a lot of listeners from overseas who this might be their first introduction to you, but there there's a lot of negative press at, at the moment. Have you felt that this has ramped up like a lot of the other um, sort of political left versus right arguments of the last decade or so? Oh, absolutely. Um, because of course, and also because of social media, I mean, you know, the fact that the Twitter, Twitter sphere 
you know, it's this horrible world where rumours and innuendos and misinformation absolutely flourish. It's, you know, it's interesting, of course, people like Jordan Peterson talk about the fact that, I mean, Jordan Peterson is not political. He's equally adverse to extremists on the left and the right, and he's spoken about that many times. Um, I'm sorry, should I explain who Jordan Peterson is? Uh, I, I know him because he's a, he's a great Canadian from the same province as yeah, myself. Yeah. But, uh, yes, why not? He's a, he's a former, he's a clinical psychologist, a former Harvard, um, clinical psychology professor now at Toronto. Um, but he's a, become one of the most, I suppose, the, the hero, you know, the absolute most powerful people on, in social, on, on YouTube initially. And then now he's left YouTube and set up his own platform. And I was one of his first, uh, I was his first Australian contributor on his new big media platform, which is called ThinkSpot. But John Peters has, of course, got millions and millions of people across the world following him because he is absolutely speaking out about the damage being done through, uh, particularly through, the point he makes about this left-right issue is, yes, there are extremists on both sides, but the left has control of the narrative right now, and the left are the real extremists in, and authoritarians. The left is the other ones who are determined to shut down free speech, as we saw, you know, in my own campaign um, on speaking out on campuses. It was all left-wing students who are out there trying to stop me speaking and who had, had felt felt absolutely entitled to impose their views of what is appropriate you know, in terms of talks on campus. And we see this across the board, that the authoritarian left are the ones introducing all sorts of rules and regulations about how we should behave uh, and are having an influence far beyond their numbers. One of the things that's, that's very interesting to me about this as well when we talk sort of um, about how the media landscape has changed is that there doesn't appear to be room for, for you to actually even share these opinions. It's no longer even saying, you know, we disagree with this. It's uh, what, what is that called? It's deplatforming now. Yeah. Do you, do you recognize when this changed or, or what's sort of your opinion on not even being able to have adult centric discussion about topics that you might not agree with? Well, I think it's gradually been getting worse, but really accelerated the last four or five years and social media playing a big role in that. Um, I mean, the classic is I was making YouTube videos and, and they were going extremely well. I had some videos with, with you know, reaching over 700,000 people. And then YouTube decided to censor me. And YouTube is censoring my videos, hiding my videos, you know, and not allowing people to access them because I'm speaking out on behalf of men. So YouTube is being driven by a feminist narrative, and I just think that's absolutely appalling. Mm. And that's why I've, got, I've left and gone to Jordan Peterson's new platform. I mean, and it applies, in, as you know, in Google, uh, Facebook, you name it, all the big platforms are being controlled uh, by the the feminist narrative, and it's very frightening. And I suppose my, what's happened to me in the last week is <laughs> is the perfect example of how we have most of our big institutions now controlled by particularly women, feminists, who are determined to shut down anything that challenges uh, their orthodoxy. And I think that's very scary. Where, where do you think – in, in a moment, we're going to get back to looking at all the statistics and some of the major issues that affect men. But where do you think we go from here in terms of just being able to say, hey, our research is suggesting this when you're deplatformed? Because even though, um, you know, I know ThinkSpot as well, but for the most part, for, you know, people who work nine to five jobs and have families, they may hear about this and then they will go through the normal outlets like a Google search or YouTube to research this. What sort of becomes the outlet for people when they want to be exposed to this? But if they're only, and I say traditional media, which is now social media these days, which is where you typically find out about things. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to know where to go. I mean, I, I, the other thing that's happened to me this week is 
my Wikipedia page has been captured by my enemies, which is mm. it sounds like a sort of you know wild west, but it's actually what happened. I can't edit it back. They're, they're piling on this information on my Wikipedia page. Wikipedia in the past, this has happened to me two or three times in the last decade. Each time I've gone back to Wikipedia and said, you know, they have a, a living person's policy where, you know, well-known no, well people, you're not supposed to be able to um, add all sorts of misinformation that distorts their career achievements. Mm. Um, and in the past they've been willing to edit it for me and now they won't. It's the Wild West. They're saying, you know, it's up to you. You just have to try to get in there and edit it. Um, I mean, it's just extraordinary. Anyway, so that's just one example. I I think people actually have to work really hard to access proper information now. And that, as you say, that's very hard for ordinary people who just, you know, have always gone to a certain newspaper or always got, look at our ABC, our national broadcaster, which is supposed to, under their charter, are supposed to be presenting fair, you know, representations of each issue. And they are absolutely captured. They're captured by leftist views on any number of issues and by the feminist narrative. And they abs- never present the balanced view on any of the issues that I'm talking about. Mm. And, you know, we make complaints and they're all automatically dismissed. Um, and, uh, you know, as you say, it's hard work getting the other side. And the other side happens to be the facts. Um, and one of the things I'm wanting to do this year is empower ordinary people to go out and provide them with information about some of the key issues that are being represented, like, for instance, domestic violence. I mean, I just get – I've probably had a 1,000 people contact me in the last week wanting to come on board some of my campaigns – and a lot of them talk about issues like domestic violence where that is being used as a means of denigrating men. It is presented only as a one-way street where it's all about violent women attack, violent men attacking women. They refuse to acknowledge our official statistics that show at least a third of the victims of domestic violence are male. Uh, and so there's a total misrepresentation of this complex social issue. I hear from... When people, men and women, who've grown up with violent mothers. I hear from women whose brothers are being abused by their wives. Or, you know, people know this is not the truth. Mm. And the statistics are there. There's over 40 years of research, probably some over 2,000 peer-reviewed studies showing the complexities of domestic violence, showing that most domestic violence is two-way, involving women as well as men. Now, I want to get ordinary people to go, you know, local councils are running, you know, campaigns around domestic violence, which are all about demonising men. I want men and women to go into their local councils and give them information and say, look at what the actual evidence actually says. We don't want violent women to get away with not being, you know, they have. we have to deal with violence as it exists. We have to protect children from violent mothers as well as violent fathers. And all our institutions need to get held to account to provide proper evidence. And I think we can have a strong grassroots movement to confront those institutions and better educate them. One of the, um, uh, what was a few years ago now, um, Cassie J did the documentary, The, The Red Pill. And I, I think I had I had read about some of these issues, but this was the first time that I had been exposed to uh, a full fledged documentary around the subject matter. And you, you talk about domestic violence, but I I found it quite harrowing. And in me, this is my opinion solely. This is the biggest issue when it relates to divorce and parental rights, shared custody, and issues like alimony. Um, and I. I have known some people that have been driven to suicide because in the divorce proceedings, not only are they required to pay alimony, but they no longer have custody of their children. So they are literally just being used as a siphon for cash without, with, without any of the relationship that, that comes out of that. Do, do you think domestic violence is, or how do you sort of 
rank all these different issues when when the severity of them can can differ depending upon typically court mandated outcomes they're all interrelated um I mean, domestic violence is the feminist's cash cow. That is the I – mean, it's a very interesting story. That, that is the, the absolute pivotal issue that the feminists are, are focusing on because that's where the money is. You know, our previous um, Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, boasted that he was spending hundreds of millions of dollars on domestic violence, and it's all about respect for women. It's all – you know, his whole narrative was about – uh, demonising men, only talking about one side. But, you know, we've got huge organisations set up around the country promoting this idea of domestic violence. Now, that filters through to our family law system. That is the major weapon now being used in family court, false allegations of violence, to to give women more rights when it comes to determining uh, the outcome in family court. If they, I mean, I hear, for instance, from policemen all over the country who are required to go into homes. Women can just ring the police and say, I'm afraid of violence. You don't even have to say violence has occurred. You can just say, I'm afraid he might be violent towards me. And the police have to go in and ha- remove that man from his home. It'll often mean he is homeless. He's, you know, doesn't have access to any of his belongings, nothing, and he's denied contact with his children often for years as a result of that one accusation, which requires no proof. And the police are saying we are being, being required to to enforce unjust laws. Mm. Um, so the domestic violence issue spills over into the family court issue. Uh, so many of the the things I talk about, you mentioned, Jesse, the the suicide, we know that one of the major trigger points for suicide for men is family breakup. There's research on that. We have a, in Australia a gender-neutral uh, national suicide policy, which totally fails to acknowledge that six out of the eight people who kill themselves every day in Australia are men, that one of the major causes of suicide is the disaster that that you know, the, the, what the disastrous situation faced by men when their families break up and the fact that they're up against huge legal fees trying to get access to their kids, often unsuccessfully, they're up against false accusations, you name it. Mm. It's this enormous, powerful pile of ammunition we're, allow, we're providing to women to do over the men they're angry with, and it's just a disaster. And why is our national suicide policy failing to acknowledge that most suicide is male? Because they don't want to address what's happening to men when they deal with family breakup. That's the truth. Well, this extends into other areas. And, and one of the things that, that also bothers me about this, um, that the modern feminist women, uh, movement is, is trying to say that there's no difference genetically between men and women and transgendered people who decide to option and transition are then completely equal biologically to the other sex. And I'm using this as a segue, you know, we, while talking about suicides, I was astounded to find, I cannot remember where I was reading the article, but they were talking about the issue of men's suicide and they were comparing that to women's. I was unaware that six out of eight are men, like you just said. But they said one of the major differences between suicide in men and in women is how the different sexes think about it. Women will tend to use um, suicide as an attempt to get attention or to look at the to, – to get care so that they can fix themselves, where men are fixated on an outcome. So when men option to suicide, they are going – they are they are attempting to reach the end, and I think it just highlights a little bit again of the fundamental difference between men and women that seems to really get neglected as they try to turn men into women in the, in the media. If you understand what I'm saying, yeah. On that point, Jesse, about the, I mean, it's interesting that is used as one of the feminist arguments to say what's why we need to pay equal attention to women because they attempt suicide more often than men. Um, you know, I mean, it's a really spurious argument. I mean, I would have thought that who actually dies is the important issue. Mm. Um, 
And so that, but that's, that it all drives me crazy the way these issues get framed. Um, sorry, I've lost, tra- lost track of where, where that was heading. No, that's all right. I was, I was talking, you mentioned another thing, guy, because I, I remember seeing, um, someone had posted a poster about homelessness and it said something along the lines of one in four women are homeless. And it, immediately your mind should go, well, who makes up the other three quarters of it then? And that, that, that right. becomes men. And they ran as well. you, see, this is the domestic violence thing. We had a campaign last year, uh, because some of the big, um, I think, I can't remember which one it was now, one of the big, um, homeless organizations was running a campaign trying to raise more funds by showing women running, you know, escaping from, um, violent men. Yes. And we wrote to them saying that is so misrepresentative of the issue. For a start, most homeless people are male. Why on earth would we, you know, misrepresent the whole issue in that way? And anyway, we got, and we got male victims of, uh, domestic violence to go in and meet with the CEO. And we, anyway, I mean, this is the sort of work I'm trying to do to say why are all these issue, issues being repre- misrepresented? Why are women's needs, women's wants, women's vulnerabilities always put ahead of men? Why do we, even in an issue like that, where clearly males are the most risk, there's this more and more beat up around women's homelessness. As if that re- that's what really matters. You know? Well, this is what I was getting to in my other question where, where you sort of got off track and you're asking me about it. And one of the other issues that I noticed in coming back to this is that, um, the, the media narrative is that men need to be softer, more understanding. All, all these issues that, that are requiring men to understand more of the female narrative, but we see none of it given back the other way. There seems to be a lot of issues now with men not understanding fundamentally their their role in society anymore. And you, I think you had talked oh, about and this. Let alone, let alone celebrating what is good about men. Mm. You know, anything that we traditionally thought was good about men is now to- toxic masculinity. I'll tell you, give you a classic example of this. I um, I put out a tweet last year, in, late last year, when the fires you know, our big bushfires were just starting. And uh, the tweet was making the point that most of the people, the firefighters who are fighting our ferocious fires in December were male. And it gave praise for the good in men, the fact that men are allowed to, men are the ones still mainly the people putting their lives on the line to protect other people. And it led to this enormous pile on. And the really funny thing that happened was, I had a photo up with a tweet of a firefighter and one of the prominent feminists uh, put out a tweet saying that the, the person I'd shown in that photo was a woman, a female fighter, firefighter. And then there was, you know, there was something like a thousand women came on and said, ah, ha, ha, stupid Bettina aunt, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, and then in the end, one of the, I don't know, I think by, one of the, I can't remember, one of the online um, newspapers did an investigation and found my photo was of a male. But of course, it didn't matter. Um, it's all, it was that was all the red herring. What photo I chose to, to put up well, there. Well, the story was the that fact I was celebrating men and we're not allowed to celebrate what's good about men. Well, the story that I distinctly remember that came out. So, so for listeners here, I think the whole world is aware that, that we're in the middle of a pretty severe bushfire crisis. Um, and it seems to have calmed down a little bit, but it's certainly not gone. But there was an article, and I think it was by a Guardian contributor. I can't remember. And they were trying to brush off the success that rural firefighters were having in the in the fires and then trying to correlate the stress of firefighting to domestic violence at home. It was one of the most bizarre things that I had seen where they were trying to connect the success of putting out fires by volunteer brigades – and the stress that that caused and how that was f- causing women to get beaten up in the home. I was astounded by the article. I don't know if you know which one oh, I'm speaking about. Totally. But that's always, a, you know, they do that with the Super Bowl and, you know, any big event, uh, particularly events where the, you know, Super Bowl is all about alcohol, of course. And mm. anyone who, people, when people drink a lot, that, see, that, I suppose, captures one of the, um, well, let me do that again. <laughs> yeah. um, what's, I mean, what's interesting about that is it exposes the deceptiveness in the feminist narrative. They, they are denying there's any issue involved in domestic violence other than 
men's attitudes to women. But in fact, one of the big issues associated with domestic violence is drug and alcohol abuse. Mm. We know when there's significant amounts of alcohol involved, both men and women are more likely to be physically violent. Uh, but the feminists won't admit that. They won't admit there's any problem with, you know, mental illness. And, of course, uh, stress, all these other events which are part of this complex problem get shelled because they're only willing to talk about nasty men and dangerous men. Um, and, of course, I suppose in the, in the bushfire, I think, if, if there is any domestic violence, I mean, I think this is all a beat-up, but it would be around the fact that people are under enormous stress in that circumstance. And I imagine there are plenty of women, uh, women firefighters, women dealing with the outcome of bushfire, who also are pretty violent and act out uh, in these circumstances, but that never gets talked about. Mm. Um, what about the issue? I, I mean, these things come up less. I, I've heard some court cases, paternity fraud is another one that, that really drives me nuts, of uh, women who have cheated on their partners, told the husband or partner that he's the father. A breakup happens, there's some issue How four years, five, six years down the line, we find out that the man is not the father of the child, and yet he is still court-mandated to um, pay child support for this. Is it, has there been any progress in this, or how how does this even happen? Um, look, I've been very very interested in that very vexed issue for many years, and I've written quite a lot about it. Talked to people on all sides of this difficult issue. I mean, for instance, I remember a man, amazing story actually, who um, <laughs> it all started with a tree lopper. You know, okay. you know the people who come in and cut down trees. Yes, he. So at a certain point in his marriage, um, the, you know, they had a guy come in and cut the trees down. Well, it turned out that this, the tree lopper had an affair with his wife. So, he, so they had this child, and the, the, the father who was talking to me was obviously thought the child was his. And then, it, and then the marriage broke up, and the wife announced she was moving from one end of Australia to the other and taking her child with her. And by the way, he was he, he isn't yours anyway. So she then said you know, confessed that the tree mm. lopper was the father. And it was a horrible court case because I think there was a three-way battle then because the tree lopper also wanted access right. to his child. Okay. And it was really terrible. But what was fascinating is he was a father who regarded it. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wanted this, him to be his child. He regarded him as his child. He'd, he'd actually done most of the child rearing, and he was desperately trying to retain his parental rights. Um, and he won that court case. I think he actually got custody of that child. Right. In the end, um, but you know, obviously, other men feel uh, like it's totally reasonable to to um, not want to pay child support, particularly if you're never seeing allowed to see those children. I mean, it's a very complex issue. What do you know about this? This is I don't believe is an issue that that you take on as much. Um, I have my own opinions on it, but we still continue to hear about the income gap and wage discrepancy between men and women who apparently do the same job. Yeah, except they don't. <laughs> Tell I us mean, more. the evidence on this is just overwhelming. Or, you know, in America, everywhere, we've had our serious experts analyze the data, and it shows that if men and women do the same work, they get the same pay, and that is mandated under law. I mean, this is just a nonsense argument, but it's a, one of the, you know, that feminism manages to recruit people by using this sort of misinformation. Mm. What else is on your mind at the moment? Once, once you, you get through this distraction um, dealing with your, your award at the moment, what's next for you? Oh, well, this, I mean, I, my award's been fantastic. I mean, I've had people who never heard of me. Get in touch with me. Hundreds and hundreds of them are writing to me saying, what can we do to help? Mm. So I'm, we just swamped at the moment. If people want to contact me, go through my website and we will be in touch as soon as we can. But I have a, I have a team of volunteers who are helping me and we want to run big campaigns around all these issues around um, domestic violence, around mass suicide, what's happening in the family court. I've been involved in the family court battle. You know, there's a, We've got a parliamentary inquiry running at the moment. 
which I'm delighted about because it's actually includes in the terms of reference false allegations of abuse. So it is naming that as one of the key issues to be addressed by this committee. And I have had a group, a team of my people, working all the last few months of last year, helping people put submissions in to that committee. Because a lot of people are uncomfortable, you know, find it difficult to encapsulate what a very, you know, summarise very d- complex law cases mm. in, in, you know, in a nice, neat form that will address, you know, pricey the or summarise the right issues. Anyway, we've had this great team of volunteers helping with that, and that's the sort of thing we want to do, empower people to help ordinary men and women learn to speak out around these issues. And I, I think we're going to have, see a great year where the quiet Australians, you know, uh, Prime Minister um, um, Scott Morrison talked about the quiet Australians, the ones who got him into power or voted for him last last election, I know the quiet Australians are on my side because I hear from them all the time. If I go into a supermarket, women will come up to me and say, I'm so pleased you're out there speaking on behalf of men. Mm. Now, I want to mobilise those quiet Australians to get very, very noisy this year. And I think we're off to a very good start. You had mentioned that they can get in touch with you to find out how they can help you. You're talking about doing committee work and policy work. How can the average person get involved and in, how can they help out? Oh, no, it's, look, it's not just policy work. It's We will have letters already set up, carefully worded, with all the evidence attached that they can just put the, put in a name and address and click off and send to whoever it is to, to make a complaint or to, to mm. point to, you know. So we, we're going to do the hard work in terms of putting all of the evidence together. We, I've got people writing to me saying that, you know, Printing companies say we'll print leaflets for you. Ah, <laughs> so we will, we will print them off and send them out to people. Uh, I know that, you know, I have everybody from, you know, body, bodybuilders to, you know, <laughs> lots yes. of people who are contacting me don't have any qualifications. They don't, and, uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of mums who haven't necessarily been in the workforce, they want to help and they can help. We need Big numbers. What the politicians, I'm working with a lot of politicians now who are very keen for me to keep doing the work I'm doing. Mm. Uh, member, ministers in this government, people on both sides, uh, and they say to me, we only ever hear from the other side. They only ever hear from the leftists. They only ever hear from the authoritarian, uh, fe- you know, feminists, and they never hear from ordinary people expressing a different point of view. And I need to mobilise ordinary people to get involved. What do you think is going to happen? You know, I, I'm I'm almost forty, so I grew up in a different generation. But what do you think about the kids that are fifteen today, or the kids that are twenty and going through university, men men rather, who are told that they're they're not valued and don't have a place? What does that mean for them as they become adults, enter families, and start having children? Oh, I think there's a lot of – I mean, I'm very sad about what's happening to men. Young men, why would a man want to become a father? I mean, for instance, mm. we, we, you know, we present fatherhood as it is, as the most wonderful thing, experience for men, and yet they know perfectly well if the mother of that child decides to pull the rug out from under them, they might have no more access to that child. It's very easy for mothers to alienate children from their fathers. I mean, obviously it works both ways. Men sometimes do this and alienate children from their fa- from the women as well. But, you know, because the women have a lot more power in this area, it's mainly working one way there. Um, it's very – sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. No, that's all right. About? Just talking about men, uh, men growing up. I mean, you, you, okay, that's just one area. I think there's – Every reason why men shouldn't even think of getting married. Marriage is is very much a dud deal for men, uh, where they just end up giving away their house. You know all the jokes about mm. you know giving away the whatever it is. I mean, men stand to lose all the, their assets, um, you know, and be paying child support for years and years and years. I mean, and spending fortunes trying to defend themselves in, in courts, in criminal court over false violence accusations, in family court trying to win access to their children. 
Uh, and I think marriage is very dangerous. We've got more and more boys dropping out of school. We've got 60% of graduates of universities are women. Universities are becoming a very strong anti-male culture and dangerous places for men, as I point out. When men, when a woman who has had too much to drink and hooks up with a guy can turn around with, the next day and say that was rape because we were both drunk and if we're both drunk, you are a rape perpetrator. Mm. That's what students are being taught in our universities, that we are setting boys up for rape accusations, and it just worries the hell out of me. For men who are looking for resources or help, where can you point them to? Uh, it depends on the issue. I mean, I'll be trying to put more and more information together on my website, but I, you know, there are great websites like there's one a website called oneinthree.com.au, one in three, and that's uh, a very good website set up by a group of professionals talking about the victims of male victims of domestic violence, and they just systematically present the official data, the official research to counter. The, the misinformation and propaganda that's out there being promoted by the feminists. Um, you know, so I am constantly um, putting out information on my social media about what what the truth is around any number of issues, alerting people to good research that's being done, uh, any new, good new websites that come around, I'll be promoting them. Um, and... Uh, and if, if I come across other people good, doing good work, of course, I naturally uh, promote that. Very good. Well, look, thank you very much for your time today. Jesse, very nice to talk to you.